Um, my talk is titled Some Disordered Exterior Geometries, um, Bioaesthetics of Zoopoetic Collaboration Within Material Discursive Folds. And I suppose the title is a bit of a play, I keep on playing with Francesca Woodman's Some Disordered Interior Geometries, which is this kind of odd text that she made inside of this Italian geometric notebook. So the title is sort of like an odd play with that, but it, we won't hear about Francesca Woodman again, unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay, so, but we do have an odd prelude. Um, so I begin this talk with a short prelude from Louis Mao's um, 1975 film Black Moon. The film opens with the main character Lily, you can see in the image, uh, played by Catherine Harrison, driving madly along a road until she rather unfortunately encounters a mammal, most likely a badger, sniffing the surface of the road and runs over it with her car, killing it. This moment of the death of an animal can be read as an, opening, um, as an opening up of a rather strange world, one in, which she, one in which the encounters that Lily has with the world around her become increasingly sonorous as plants and animals begin to vocalize in the woods and fields around her. The film can be read as a kind of post-apocalyptic Alice in Wonderland story, but in this rendition, there are darker overtones to the world of fantasy that Alice is inhabiting. There is a war going on in the background between men and women, for instance, and Lily will eventually find herself in the strangely eroticized world of a sprawling house populated by an old woman who keeps on changing size, a talking rat and many other animals that you can see in this image, and a brother and sister who are in some sort of an incestuous relationship with one another. But what I want to focus on here as a way into my paper are the moments when the sonorous qualities of the world and the film begin to manifest as a mode of non-human speech. In the first moment that this occurs, Lily is running through the woods trying to escape the gendered carnage around her. She stumbles and falls on top of some flowers. As this occurs, the flowers begin to emit a sharp-pitched cry in response to being trampled. Lily is stunned by the revelation that the non-human entities around her are capable of some kind of communication, and this opens up her perceptual space as she begins to notice more and more details and activities occurring around her at non-human scales of sense. Centipedes crawling through the dirt, or earthworms rolling around in the wet soil. Like in some sense, she just kind of face plants, and these flowers begin to cry, and then all these like centipedes begin crawling in front of her face. Um, and here's a scene from a little later in the film where she encounters the crying flowers again, as well as another more fantastical creature. So I'll play just a very short clip as a kind of way in. That would be cool if possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me know if you can hear it. 
the temple of those innocent flowers to death, and you dare say you're not me. Oh, you should practice what you preach. You're eating the flowers. Suppose we change the subject? <laughs> to be rude, but you're not very graceful. In my books, unicorns are slim and white. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. The most beautiful things in the world are the most useless. Peacocks and lilies, for instance. <laughs> you know, the old lady upstairs, she didn't want me to see you. Oh, Lord, you mean that babbling biddy on the wireless upstairs? Don't pay any attention to her. She's not even real. What do you mean she's not real? I touched her. I spoke to her. I even saw her die. I mean what I mean. And my little one, I could give you some precious information concerning that old house. <laughs> I'm very good manners. I've had this before. I'm so that it drives me back. I'm even right away. And I won't be back for another 154 years. Hey, come back. I like talking to you. Nobody talks to me here. Okay. I highly recommend this movie, although it's truly weird. Um, but unfortunately, we won't be hearing very much more about unicorns. But um, okay. So um, yes, that scene, scene did feature a talking unicorn. And while this, um, on one hand, may suggest that the possibility of non-human and human communication may be rather fantastical. Nothing but a childhood dream that I must admit I had of being Dr. Doolittle and communicating with non-human beings, which I dutifully exercised in the 1980s by walking around with a tape recorder and making recordings of stray cats, which I then played to other cats that I encountered in the hope of being able to communicate with them. I would like to consider in this talk how this, I did do this, how this dream of non-human communication may be at play in fields such as biosemiotics. In other words, how it may seep from the realm of fantasy to suggest a kind of biosemiotic continuity between human and non-human beings. Go back to. At the opening of a foray into the worlds of animals and humans, the Estonian biologist and one of the founding figures of the study of biosemiotics, Jakob von Uxkul, takes his readers on a stroll on a sunny day before a flowering meadow in which insects buzz and butterflies flutter. And you can see an image of that meadow from the perspective of a bee up there. Actually, the bee's perspective is down in the bottom picture and the human perspective is in the top picture. Each of the organisms situated in this meadow is surrounded by a bubble of sensations, or an umwelt, which envelops that organism within a sheer garment full of signs that designate the significance of different entities that it encounters. As such, Ukskul envisions a biological world filled with signs in which each organism acts as a subject, continuously interpreting its surroundings. Contemporary biological research has been revealing a parallel vision of a world in which organisms, in a sense, read the environment around them for signs of significance. Crows can communicate with one another about human faces, so that even crows who have not been directly exposed to the faces of those humans that their conspecifics have deemed dangerous can later recognize those specific people. And a lot of this research has been done by John Marsleff at University of Washington. He basically gets his grad students to wear funny masks and then do slightly mean things to crows. And then crows actually tell stories across generations about these people in mean masks and actually remember them and attack them reliably for a really long period of time. Um, 
Snails, um, <laughs> one of my favorite articles, Snails and Their Trails, tells us that snails can interpret the slime trails left by other snails to navigate, aggregate into groups or search for mates. And some snails, like the females of Litterina sextalis, can even mask their sex in order to avoid being followed by unwanted mates. Which I think is pretty cool. Um, so, similarly, in her research on plant communication, the forestry botanist Suzanne Simard has revealed that trees communicate with one another through mycorrhizal fungal networks, transferring nutrients or defense signals to one another. Whereas Evelyn Fox Keller and Lee Segal have discovered even slime molds respond to signs around them. So the release of a single molecular cue of arcasin, or acrasin maybe, can lead thousands of individual amoeba to come together to aggregate into a multicellular entity. Such studies suggest that there's an unfolding current of conversation in the natural sciences, a buzz with a sense that biological materiality possesses a semiotic or a linguistic dimension. But how has this conversation permeated the recent inquiries into non-human forms of life in the humanities, with their rich disciplinary resources for considering questions of semiosis and meaning making? In her recent book, Becoming Undone, Darwinian Reflections on Life, Politics, and Art, Elizabeth Graz, a feminist philosopher whose work has attempted to address biological configurations of bodies from a non-essentialist, non-dualist perspective, and who has more recently turned towards explorations of animal life and art, urges the scholars in the humanities to consider non-human forms of life and materiality. And I quote, what would the study of, for example, literature and language, which did not privilege the human as its paradigm, look like? Is it possible for us to understand, say, language differently beyond and outside the limits of the human? Could there be an ethology of language? Writing about the implications of Charles Darwin's work for the humanities and the manner in which his understanding of evolution decenters the privileged position of the human, Groves goes on to suggest that it is Darwin's conception of animals and plants, the world of the living, which equally incorporates the animal, the vegetal, and the human alongside protozoa, bacteria, and viruses that has yet to fully impact the humanities. More recently, this broader turn towards the non-human has allowed developing interdisciplinary fields such as animal studies to assume, to assume more presence within the humanities disciplines and has opened up a complex set of conceptual relations between considerations of animate forms of non-human biological materiality and the emergent theories of the ways in which inanimate forms of matter may be sites of agency and indeterminacy. In the introduction to an edited volume, New Materialisms, Diana Kuhl and Samantha Frost call for a theoretical reorientation away from the sole consideration of, I quote, language, discourse, and culture, and a return to the most fundamental questions about the nature of matter, and a renewed sensitivity towards, and I quote again, developments in the natural sciences that are attending closely to contemporary shifts in the bio and ecospheres. Similarly, in her book, Vibrant Matter, political scientist Jane Bennett formulates an understanding of matter and not exclusively organic matter as possessing vibrancy, which renders it agentive and lively as it continuously undergoes non-teleological processes of unfolding. This turn towards materiality has, in a sense, served as a corrective to the linguistic turn, which had dominated theoretical <laughs> traditions in the humanities disciplines um, for the preceding four decades, effectively locking the terms of inquiry within an epistemological and a discursive loop. The broader contours of the linguistic turn typically figured matter, for instance, the biological materiality of human and non-human bodies, as immutable and deterministic, and hence as vulnerable to various forms of essentialism, positioning the linguistic and the cultural in counterdistinction as politically potent sites of complexity, malleability, and historicity that could undermine such essentialisms. The currently unfolding theoretical considerations of materiality have pushed ba back against these notions of matter as a site of deterministic fixity, yet they've often done so at the cost of failing to seriously consider that materiality and language may be complexly and perhaps irresolvably imbricated, and that such imbrications possess a rich aesthetic dimension. Hence the, the crying grass. Such aesthetic considerations of the material qualities of language have been a long-standing site of exploration in fields such as poetics, with their attendant interest in the textured sounds and shapes that language makes. <laughs> 
As such, the current influx of theoretical considerations of non-human materialities and the humanities has found a fertile ground for considering the materiality of semiotic processes in the study of poetry, leading in turn to an emerging subfield of materialist poetics. This paper positions itself within this emerging discussion of materialist poetics as it investigates how poetics, with its attunement to the linguistic dimension, can attend to liveliness of materiality in ways that do not compromise the capacity of poetry to consider the aesthetic dimension of how the semiotic and the material intersect. Its central focus is the Xenotext experiment, a project in which a Canadian poet, Christian Book, offers a striking exploration of how poetics may draw on biosemiotic configurations of biological materiality. Book encrypts a poem in a sequence of nucleotides that comprise the DNA of a bacterium and then gets this microscopic organism to become a kind of post-human collaborator in his project by producing a second collaborative poem in the molecular structure of a protein that is expressed on the basis of the inserted DNA sequence. So there are two poems at play here, one which is encoded in the DNA by Christian Book and then the expression of that DNA poem is the protein poem that the organism makes or fails to make, as the case may be, as you will find out. Um, the aesthetic qualities of Book's genetic text are reliant on the sense that the molecular dynamics of a living organism are simultaneously a site of a lively form of biological materiality and an active site of signification. In other words, as Book engages what he comes to describe as a literary dimension of biological molecular substrates, his poetic writing becomes literally molecular in its form. He suggests that this kind of extension of poesis to DNA will create a sense that the genome can now become a vector for hitherfore unimagined modes of artistic innovation and cultural expression. As a result, in the future, genetics might lend a possible literary dimension to biology, granting, and I definitely quote this last part, geneticists the power to become poets in the medium of life. Um, so this is kind of like biology review a little bit. <laughs> so I just put up this um, diagram so that you can kind of think a little bit about how DNA becomes RNA and then becomes protein, but also sort of guide you through it. Um, so at the most basic level, Book's poem is reliant for its method of encryption on the conceptualization of DNA as a code made up of four letters that are assigned to the four different nucleic acids that make up each of the strands of the double helix of the DNA molecule. And you can see the DNA in yellow, the double helix of the DNA, DNA kind of draping as a little arc um, right there in that corner of the image. Um, and the DNA, as you probably remember, is made up of um, four different kinds of nucleotides, adenine, which is usually labeled A, thymine T, cytosine C, and guanine G. Um, each three-letter um, combination made up of three nucleotide bases is called a DNA codon. So when you get, um, you get something like TCG in a row, that's a codon. So basically three letters are a codon. Um, and obviously there's complementary base pairings so that A and T always pair together and C and G always pair together. Um, as Bach assigns a codon of DNA to each letter of the alphabet, so he takes this kind of three-letter unit and assigns it to the letter of the alphabet, um, the complementary amino acid gets assigned to a letter of the alphabet in the second protein poem. So I'll just slow down a little bit. So you have the DNA there in the corner. It's um, basically copied, you can think of it as like photocopied into RNA, which is like the white strand, which then goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, attaches itself to the ribosome, um, and the mRNA is sort of like a mirror image photocopy of the DNA, and it's like a little three-letter unit or the codon will be what will determine which amino acid will be selected. And the amino acids are the like large purple blobs over in that corner of the image, um, and so they're kind of strung together. You can think of them a little bit as like beads in a necklace, and then they eventually fold into a kind of protein shape in the corner. Is that sort of somewhat mildly clear? Okay. Um, so, as Book assigns a codon of DNA to each letter of the alphabet, the complementary amino acid gets assigned to a letter of the alphabet in the second protein poem. But there is an intermediary step. In order for the DNA sequence to be translated, it's translated into RNA. So I've already sort of explained that. Um, so figuratively, the mRNA uh, can be conceptualized as a reverse mirror image photocopy that is made from a select book or gene in the library of the DNA that the cell is currently using. Um, 
and sort of complementary base pairing is the cell's way of making such mirror image reverse copies, and it always involves the pairing of adenine with thymine or uracil. So in the case of RNA, uracil is always there instead of thymine, and a pairing of guanine with cytosine. In this image from the Xenotext experiment, uh, the mRNA sequence is represented as the black letter sequence in the pink part of the poem. Um, so that the AGG codon of DNA, for instance, produces the UCC sequence in the mRNA. So the DNA is on top in the green, and then in the pink you have the RNA, and you can kind of see the complementary base pairing occurring there. Um, in turn, this mRNA sequence is responsible for selecting the corresponding amino acid, and in this case, within box uh, cipher, the amino acid must be arginine, which he has assigned um, to the letter T. So um, thus A and T always correspond to one another as do S and F. So you can kind of see in the first, just the first letters A and T that they will always be paired within his cipher as will S and F. So you can kind of see that each time that S occurs um, in the top part, F will occur in the bottom part and vice versa. Um, thus A and T always correspond to one another as do S and F. The coding process in question is called encipherment because it involves pairing off each letter of the alphabet with another so that they're mutually correlated with each other. Um, and I just explained that as in S correlates with F and F correlates with S and so on. Book then uses one of these ciphers to write the first poem and as each letter is replaced with a complementary letter from the cipher, it has to produce the corresponding amino acid poem. So there's a kind of double constraint operating here. As he's writing the top poem, he needs it to produce something kind of sensical, like something that has sense in the bottom part using the cipher. And he kind of has to play until he figures out which cipher will work and give him that result. Um, the text of the first poem, Dad Orpheus, consists of the line, any style of life is prim, and is encoded by Bok into the nucleotide sequence of the DNA, while the complementary protein poem, Eurydice, is composed of a sequence of amino acids and states, the fairy is rosy of glow. The content of the second poem, as well as the rosy color depicted in this figure, actually refers to the fluorescent tag that Book has added to his gene construct, which will get converted into a protein that fluoresces when the poem is expressed, thus indicating that the experiment has work, worked. So you can kind of think of this fluorescent tag as almost kind of like a post-it note you would attach to your gene so that you, when it got expressed, it would basically, everything would fluoresce pink so you would know that the project was actually working, the poem was being made, that would be your indication. And this is kind of like a common technique used in biotechnology, so nothing particularly special. Um, so Book's work on the Xenotext has now been ongoing for over 15 years, with the project receiving substantial funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And over this span of time, it has been documented in a number of ways, from various interviews, an article in a top-tier scientific journal Nature, to an art exhibition at the Bury Art Gallery in Manchester. And most recently, in 2015, the Canadian press Coach House Books published the Xenotext Book One, which is going to be followed by Volume Two. In a concluding section of the Xenotext Book One, Book briefly describes the details of the experimental protocol that he has developed to generate the poetic text of the Xenotext in the lab, suggesting that the reader can think of the printed text as both the genetic primer, whose role is to reacquaint the reader with some basic idea of genetics, and an infernal grimoire, a kind of book of magic spells or invocations, which introduces the concepts for his experiment. As a primer on genetics, the Xenotext Book 1 elucidates the procedures undertaken in the lab to bring the Xenotext to fruition, while simultaneously performing alternate textual experiments that explore various constraint-based compositional, compositional procedures. The constraints evident in these textual compositions parallel the constraints based on the conceptualization of biological molecules, such as DNA as codes but also take into account, particularly as Book's lab experiment progresses, the constraining problematics of biological molecules as three-dimensional shapes with specific folding top topographies. And this kind of problem, so he's kind of in a way using the book partly to experiment with different kind of permutations of codes, but in a way when things go to the lab, things get more complicated and shape becomes much more integral to the project. The use of constraint in Book's poetic practice is nothing new. His first book of poetry, Eunoia, is divided into five discrete sections, each of which uses only words that contain only one of the vowels available in the English language, A, E, I, O, U, while excluding all words that use one of the other vowels, 
And in the book that follows crystallography that Nathan has written extensively about in his book, The Limits of Fabrication, these problematics of constraint are coupled with a consideration of the molecular structure of various crystals. And here I just have an image from crystallography of emerald, and you can kind of see that it's, it's basically an acrostic that uses all of the elements that make up a molecule of emerald as many times as they actually occur in the molecule to compose the acrostic. While Book's engagement with actual configurations of living matter in the course of composing the Xenotext appears as a radical departure from his previously textually based compositional process, I would like to suggest that these diverse poetic practices share many continuities with one another, because they're both concerned with developing a molecular poetics that is reliant on the relationship between code and shape, or in broader terms, the relationship between materiality and semiosis. I would argue, however, that Book's understanding of constraint-based poetic practices transforms and expands in the course of working on the Xenotext in order to encompass not only the arbitrary constraints imposed by the understanding of DNA as a sequential code of nucleotides, or the sense of a protein as a linear string of amino acids, but also the non-arbitrary constraints imposed by the biomaterial properties of proteins as three-dimensional molecular shapes, which can fold in a number of limited, basically a limited number of ways. One of the central threads that links books various lab-based experiments with DNA and proteins with the text-based experiments performed in the Xenotext is the narr narrative of Orpheus <coughs> and Eurydice. The name of the two poems created in the laboratory, Orpheus and Eurydice, refer references the translation of Virgil's Georgics, which appears in the beginning of the Xenotext. This linkage enacts a number of thematic echoes in the overall poetic project. The double loss, loss of Eurydice is brought about in the first case by the attempted rape um, by Aristeus, which leaves her vulnerable to a snake bite and leads to her death. And in its second iteration, it is brought about by Orpheus's famous attempt to rescue her from the underworld, which is blighted by his impatient and forbidden look back, dooming her once again. Entwined with the double loss, um, with her double loss is the disappearance of, of Aristeus's bees, which occurs in the Georgics as a punishment for his attempted rape. The disappearance of the bees redoubles as an echo of loss once again because of the contemporary conditions of environmental degrada degradation, which have, brought, which have brought about a decline in bee populations known as colony collapse disorder, which serves as a kind of portent of the telos of environmental catastrophe in Book's poem. These iterative forms of loss are evocative of the challenge that the execution of the protein poem has posed for Book. While the poem has been successfully executed in Escherichia coli, the most challenging aspect has been the creation of a viable protein that can fold into a three-dimensional shape that will persist for some time in the cell without getting digested. And Book has not yet been able to execute this aspect of the project in his intended experimental organism, the extremophile bacterium Deinococcus radiorans, or at least he hasn't been able to get it to kind of persist. As such, naming the protein poem Eurydice is evocative of the sense that the execution of this aspect of the poem has nearly come within Book's grasp, but has so far eluded him by repeatedly disappearing in counterdistinction to his conceptual goals, which dictate the creation of a poem that will last forever, outliving, and this, these are his words, outliving every civilization, persisting on the planet until the very last dawn when our star finally explodes. The second aspect of naming the two poetic sites, Orpheus and Eurydice, aligns with Book's conceptualization of gender in his poetic experiment. In an interview in the online magazine Culture Lab, Book describes the DNA poem as, I quote, a very masculine assertion about the aesthetic creation of life. In contrast, Book describes the tone of the second poem as, I quote, melancholy, feminine, almost surreal. His rather surprising use of gender in the descriptions of these two poems aligns with the gendering effects in the history of biology, which have rendered the cytoplasm of the cell where the majority of the proteins are found and where the proteins are synthesized as the feminine sphere of the cell. While the nucleus where the genes are housed, at least in eukaryotic cells, assumes the qualities of the masculine arena. In spatializing gender within the cell in this way, the xenotext can be read in relation to the long intertwined histories of heredity and biological development out of which the science of modern genetics emerged. And in Pearl's paper, we've already sort of seen a glimpse of this kind of longer history of heredity. And here I'm primarily focusing on the 20th century. But 
um, we were kind of actually using similar sources. So in A Cultural History of Heredity, Stefan Müllerwall and Hans um, Jörg Reinberger point out the development, point out that I quote, development and inheritance were not seen as two distinct autonomous processes until the rise of modern biology in the 19th century or even as late as the beginning of the 20th century when genetics established itself as a discipline. This meant that understandings of how heritable qualities could be passed on from parents to offspring were irresolvably entangled with, and I quote again from them, the series of circumstances that accompanied copulation, conception, pregnancy, birth, and even weaning in mammals. And this close quote, and as a result, the various oscillating histories of how gender was seen to play a role in these processes influenced the understanding of gender in the context of heredity. So I guess I'm kind of tracing how gender, like how genetics itself becomes sort of gendered because it's carrying through these really, really long gendered histories of thinking about symbiosis and materiality. Um, writing precisely about the understandings of maternal and paternal contributions to reproduction in the history of biology in her book, Refiguring Life, Metaphors of 20th Century Biology, the historian of science, Evelyn Fox Keller, addresses the work of the geneticist, Ruth Sager, who studied the effects of maternal or cytoplasmic inheritance in the single-celled protist, Clamidomonas. Keller notes that even though Sager tried to relabel the term maternal inheritance with the term unit parental inheritance, her colleagues derisively referred to her work as Ruth's defense of the egg. Keller situates this particular remark in a wider history, which has typically attributed the locus of activity to the nucleus and aligned it with paternal contributions, while relegating the cytoplasm to the role of a passive environment in which the activity of the nucleus plays out. And here's a slightly longer quote from Keller. Thus, many debates about the relative importance of nucleus and cytoplasm in inheritance inevitably reflect older debates about the relative importance or activity of maternal and paternal contributions to reproduction, where the overwhelming historical tendency has been to attribute activity and motive force to the male contribution while relegating the female contribution to the role of passive facilitating environment. In platonic terms, the egg represented the body and the nucleus the activating soul. Um, and then thinking back to Nathan's opening paper, um, in many ways this platonic conception of the dualist division between information and matter in the context of genetics reflects the demarcation of the materiality of the Quora, which is gendered feminine, and the idealized hylomorphic notion of form, which allows it to take shape. Keller's reading of these intertwined histories of heredity and reproduction points to a dualist tendency which has historically gendered the element that brings about the generation of form as masculine, suggesting that it is the element that actively informs the materiality of the egg, which was seen as feminized and passive. While contemporary understandings of reproduction, where both the sperm and the egg contribute genetic material, have displaced these historical understandings of what happens during fertilization, the dualist tendency itself has been erroneously transposed onto the relationship between the DNA and cytoplasm to produce what Keller critically calls the gene-centric perspective, where genes are understood to be the central controlling agents programming and informing the functioning of the other cellular components in the cytoplasm. As such, this gene-centric tendency within contemporary biology shares a historical genealogy with a hylomorphic logic through which materiality and semiosis are seen as, uh, seen as distinct in gendered terms. In his exploration of the aesthetic potential of genetics in the Xenotext experiment, Boke at first uncritically imports these dualist assumptions, which distinguish the genes as disembodied carriers of information through the materiality of the cytoplasm, which acts as a site of their expression. As such, Book's project actively replicates the existence of the gender dualism that has been at play within the longer histories of scientific and philosophical understandings of living matter, in much the same way that this dissociation between matter and signification finds itself at the heart of many contemporary biotechnology projects that seek to use the genome as a possible site of inscription and a repository of information. In fact, the target organism that Book has selected, uh, the bacterium Deinococcus radiorans, is particularly suitable for thinking about the longevity of such inscription procedures because it is an extremophile capable of surviving without mutation in even the most hostile milieus, including the vacuum of outer space. That description is um, from Book. 
Bux desire to use the radio, radio Durance as the ultimate host for the Xenotext is also inspired by, in part by the fact that scientists have already attempted to use the genome of this organism in order to store information. In 2003, scientists inserted the song It's a Small World as a 150 base pair long DNA segment into the genome of this bacterium and were able to retrieve it and decode it 100 generations later without alteration. Another project the book cites was as the inspiration for the Xenotext has been the encoding of a line from Book 2 of Virgil's Georgics into the genome of a plant known as Thale Cress, so that the DNA of the plant now contains the encoded line, nor can the earth bring forth all fruit alike in Latin. A significant difference between these experiments and the Xenotext consists in the fact that the scientists working on inserting a line of the Georgics into the Thale Cress for instance, are explicit about the fact that the encoded line of text that they're inserting into the DNA sequence does not contain information expressed by the organism. So in this case, the organism is simply kind of an archive. In other words, for them, the genome of this plant is simply a repository or a form of storage for the information, while Book's insistence in producing two poetic sites in the Xenotext one based on the inserted DNA sequence and the other on the protein produced as the sequence is expressed, enters into a much more complex relation with the lively dynamics enacted by the somatic unfolding of the organism in question. This is another reason why the snag or the difficulty the book encounters in the execution of the xenotext plays an important conceptual role in the interpretation of the project, shifting the impetus from the smooth figuration of the DNA's information, and hence as an unproblematic archival repository of textual data, to the problematics of molecules as folded three-dimensional shapes, which carry biosemiotic significance through their interactions, often involving shifts in conformation or shape, which can be understood as tiny alterations in their folds, and which in turn take place within the variegated rhythms of somatic and genetic and hence lived temporalities. Such lively somatic forms of time possess a non-monumental logic distinct from books more conceptual desire to generate an immutable and hence eternal work of art. And in their divergent material unfoldings, they create a differentiated set of less essentializing biological rhythms, ones that open up the possibility for imagining a more gradiated range of temporality between absolute fixity and the telos of catastrophic change. So in the kind of, um, we're kind of at the heart of the paper and there's a kind of arc that I'm building between basically going from code to shape to time. And in some sense, in the context of our, the conversation we've been having at this conference, I'm thinking of shape as a kind of structure. So I'm trying to sort of move from like code as a more kind of um, disembodied sense of understanding information to this sense of like shape and the semiotics of shape to a kind of, you will see towards the end, um, a kind of falling apart of shape into, in, through a kind of non-monumental non conception of time. Um, so, one code. The conceptualization of DNA as, a tex as textual information has been a subject of a long-standing critique among researchers in science and technology studies who have pointed out over and again the figurative and perhaps anthropocentric play that is implicated in our understanding of DNA as a form of language. For instance, in her book, The Poetics of DNA, Judith Roof takes up the question of the relationship between language and DNA by examining various analogies, metaphors, and other figurations that have configured DNA as a language that is at the core of all life. She suggests that as metaphors such as those of the code, the book, the alphabet, sentences, words, the blueprint, the text, the map, the homunculus, software, and others are used to describe DNA, a certain sense of it as a materially situated biological molecule is elided. Roof's critique is particularly significant in that it points to a risk of a hylomorphic split between information and materiality, one in which codes can easily become detached from the material substrates that bind them to specific circumstances of embodiment. Such critiques of DNA as code also resonate with the historically situated circumstances that have produced the epistemic conditions within which genes are understood to be a form of information. In A Cultural History of Heredity, Muller, Will, and Reinberger point out that the understanding of heredity as a form of information, figured through a number of concomitant textual metaphors, arose specifically in the context of the 20th century with the rise of molecular biology and the discernment of DNA as a material substrate of heredity. That, and I quote from them, the textual metaphors that accompanied the rise of molecular biology now come to be materialized in these technologies, 
reading as DNA analysis, writing as DNA synthesis, copying as the polymerase chain reaction, and editing as the procedures for mutating genes. As such, heredity came to be conceived not as the transmission of bodily characters, but as an information system, as a semiotic universe in its own right. Book's project is most vulnerable to such critique when he engages in creating arbitrary relationships between the letters of the alphabet that he limits himself to in the composition of the xenotext, and the manner in which these letters are used to arbitrarily designate certain molecular structures. In the poem, The Genetic Code, which appears as part of a longer sequence of the xenotext titled The March of the Nucleotides, Book describes his reliance on the conceptualization of the genetic code as, I quote, a limited lexicon consisting of 64 words called codons, remember those are little three-letter combinations, created by permuting all possible trigrams from a set of nucleobases in RNA, A, C, G, and U. And so here you can see a codon table. So if you were kind of trying to figure out how a protein would be built, you would use a table like this. And you would look up your three-letter combination. And there's actually redundancy in the code. So that a single amino acid and there in these big squares in the middle is actually coded for by multiple, um, mul multiple codons. Um, Book explicitly follows up on this textual or linguistic understanding of the codon as word in the central dogma, which is another poem, where he explains that a set of three consecutive bases in a strand makes a codon, a word that can instruct a cell to create one of the 20 amino acids found in all proteins. Each of these codons in Book's words signifies a specific amino acid, although the code contains redundancy in that an amino acid can have multiple codons that refer to it, as I just mentioned. So that, for example, there exist six synonyms for arginine, AGA, AGG, and so on. I'm not going to read all of them. But each one refers only to this molecule. Book explains that this code is virtually universal and that no word used to create anything alive needs to be longer than three letters. In composing the suite of poems titled The Nucleobasis, Book relies on such arbitrary or conventional assignment of particular letters of the alphabet to particular molecules to create a series of modular acrostics in which the structure of a molecule defines the arrangement of a restricted vocabulary. Only words of nine letters beginning with one of the following, C for carbon, H for hydrogen, N for nitrogen, or for O for oxygen. The resulting poems are formally continuous with many of the poems that appear in crystallography, if you think back to the emerald poem that I had put up, in that both draw on the atomic composition of molecules to restrict their possible lexicons. And so here's an example of one of them, um, cytosine. In the poem Cytosine, for instance, Book takes the molecular formula of the nucleotide cytosine, which has four carbons, five hydrogens, three nitrogens, and an oxygen, and composes an acrostic which uses all of these elements in its composition the appropriate number of times, so that the resulting poem textually replicates the same number of specific atoms that also occur in the molecule itself. On the facing page, Book presents a schematic image of cytosine's molecular structure as it would be annotated in organic chemistry, with a characteristic shape of an aromatic carbon ring and an amine group composed of nitrogen and hydrogen, as well as a keto group consisting of a doubly bonded oxygen atom. Below this image, Book composes a short poem that is constrained in such a way that each of the words begins with the same letter as one of the atoms that composes the cytosine molecule. So that there are four words that begin with the letter C, cultivate, chrysalid, cloisters, culturing, five words that begin with the letter H, heedfully husbanded, hereafter, helotries, three words that begin with the letter N, nymph-like nunneries and necropoli, and one word that begins with the letter O, o orgiastic. The thematic material for the poem references back to the earlier colony collapse disorder sequence, and in particular the bees, which appear and disappear in book four of Virgil's Georgics. So that the poem reads in sequential order as, I'm not sure if you can read it, but it reads, nymph-like honeybees cultivate orgiastic nunneries, chrysalid necropoli heedfully husbanded, cloisters hereafter culturing helotries. Even though in composing the nucleobasis, book is at times clearly quite attentive to the three-dimensional shapes of biological molecules, drawing on the various resources of concrete and visual poetry in order to represent them, the formal patterning of the poem is still reliant primarily on a constraint-based practice which draws its limitations from the letters that begin the names of the elements that compose the molecular structure of specific nucleotides. As such, there's a kind of arbitrary or primarily conventional alignment here between language and materiality, 
In other words, signs operate through a kind of Saussurean logic, which does not produce any inherent link between names and the molecules that they designate. So that the poetic constraint-based procedural play the book is engendering here operates primarily within the register of language, rather than the actual molecular structures of the nucleotides. One way that the form of the poem does entangle itself more deeply with the structure of the nucleotides occurs through the patterning and repetition of sounds in that the repetition of words that begin with the letter N, nymph-like nunneries necropoli in the case of the cytosine poem, is indicative of a number of times that an atom of nitrogen appears in the molecular structure of cytosine. This differs when it comes to the nucleotide adenine, which, for instance, which only has five nitrogen atoms. And so in composing the poem adenine, book uses five words that begin with the letter N, nurturant, nursemaid, nectarious, narcotics, numbingly. As such, the formal properties of poetic structure generated through alliteration register the patterning of molecular structure. This formal patterning is employed by book to an even more interesting effect when it comes to the poem, The Virile of Amino Acids, in which, as Book explains in Vita Explicata, and I quote, the arrangement of words in a line corresponds to a specific, specified structure in each molecule, and, whatever this structure, sorry, and wherever the structure reoccurs among the molecules, so also does the line of poetry reoccur among the acrostics. For instance, all of the amino acids share a common backbone composed of a complex of amine and carboxylic acid, and as a result, Book explains, every poem in the suite ends with the same refrain, no hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. As such, the formal patterns of repetition and variation that structure the poem register the patterns of molecular repetition and variation that structure the amino acids as building blocks of proteins. And as a result, the poetic structure is indicative of molecular structure. So in some sense, if you were just to listen to a reading of the poems, through alliteration, you would actually be begin you could pick up patterning of molecular structure through the sound of the poem, which is kind of interesting. Um, the parallel the book posits between the discrete and recombinable properties of the letters of the alphabet and the conceptualization of atoms as similarly discrete and recombinable particles is evocative of the analogy between atoms and letters that is described by Lucretius in Their Aram Natura. And I quote from Lucretius. It makes a great difference in what combinations and positions the same elements occur and what motions they mutually pass on and take over, so that with a little reshuffling, the same ones may produce forests and fires. This is just how the words themselves are formed, by a little reshuffling of the letters, when we pronounce forests and fires as two distinct utterances. Through this comparison between forests and fires, Lucretius posits an overlap between linguistic and material registers, indicating that a different arrangement of atoms constitutes, for instance, a forest and a forest fire, while a slight rearrangement and addition or subtraction of letters produces the words forests and fires. In other words, for Lucretius, the composition, whether of the material world or of language, is a matter of such particulate recombinations so that in both cases, a finite number of variable shapes can recompose to form everything that constitutes the cosmos. Um, so I'm going to skip a little bit so, um, to get to the section on shape. Um, as I have illustrated, many of the poems that book constructs in the Xenotext Book 1 rely on such strategies of recombination of discrete particulate elements. This logic of creating analogous relations between letters and atoms also governs the constraint-based compositional strategies that Book employs in the lab in enciphering the poem into the structure of the DNA, in that, as I have elaborated earlier, he simply assigns a letter of the alphabet to a particular DNA codon, and then through encipherment, assigns another letter of the alphabet to the corresponding amino acid. And so the difficulty here is primarily in constructing this double layer of code, but we're still at a kind of arbitrary logic over the kind of permutations of code. But this logic begins to shift um, once Book begins to consider the molecular structure of the protein molecule that is formed on the basis of the DNA sequence. In other words, in this transition, the poem becomes concerned with the problematic of shape or the question of how a protein can fold into a viable three-dimensional molecule rather than remaining solely concerned with the sequence um, information of how the nucleotides or the corresponding amino acids are strung together into a linear code. 
And a similar shift occurs in Lucretius's thinking, and I'll sort of like paraphrase that, but Lucretius becomes really, really interested in the texture of atoms. And so he's, um, he's convinced that in some sense, we can kind of sense this texture at the macro scale of our own perceptual systems. So that like, for instance, salty water that you may have tasted earlier today would taste salty according to Lucretius because its atoms are actually barbed and hooked and they kind of like bite into your tongue. While something like honey and milk might taste sweet because the atoms themselves are actually round. Um, and as strange as this may sound, actually like there's a similar kind of shift occurring in bio th contemporary thinking in biology towards this kind of thinking towards shape. Um, so a similar shift in thinking that stretches the considerations of code towards those of shape is taking place in contemporary research in molecular biology. The studies that have assessed the impact of the mapping of the sequence of the human genome since its completion nearly two decades ago have emphasized the importance of the three-dimensional structure of the DNA and its sculptural molecular form for understanding the way the DNA interacts with other molecules. In an article titled Genomics, Genomes in the Three Dimensions, published in February 2011 issue of Nature, Monia Baker offers a review of the recent research into the significance of the three-dimensional genome architecture for the regulation of gene activity. One of the researchers that Baker cites um, suggests that understanding gene regulation involves understanding the three-dimensional structure of the complex assemblage of DNA and proteins that makes up the chromosomes. And I quote, there are many more sites with regulatory potential than we have genes, and the only way to know which site is acting on which gene is to get three-dimensional. As such, in his struggle to realize the Xenotex project, the book actually creates a poetic experiment that powerfully embodies the dynamics of this paradigm shift in biological research itself. And so in some sense, I think the difficulties he's having in executing his project are partly due to the fact that he's kind of in a way at the cutting edge of what the geneticists themselves are trying to figure out about the kind of importance of three-dimensionality. Um, so proteins are folded shapes often made up of a number of complex subunits and their bioactivity is contingent on the shifting shape of these subunits in relation to one another and in response to their shapes and electrical force fields of the molecules that interact and bind to them. So you can think of proteins as like tiny little sculptures that make you up into this big sculpture that you are. Um, I'm interested specifically in how Book's project explores the three-dimensional nature of these interactions in the extension of the practice of micropoetics to the surfaces, shapes, and textures that affect the active interplay of matter even at this minute molecular scale. In the opening section of the March of the Nucleotides, the poem, The Central Dogma, Book describes in detail the process of protein folding that occurs once the amino acids have been strung together by the ribosome. And I quote from Book. The ribosome builds a string of such amino acids until encountering a codon that signifies the punctuation of a full stop. And because each acid has its own unique charge, parts of the created protein become either hydrophilic or hydrophobic when exposed to the solvent in the cytoplasm of the cell. The forces of both mutual attraction and mutual repellency distributed among the acids in the chain cause the strand to fold and bend, torquing the protein into a conformation that requires the lowest amount of energy to sustain. The surface contours of such a folded strand determine the biochemical interaction that the protein can finally perform with other enzymes in the cell. It is in considering the properties of protein folding that Book's analysis departs from the conceptualization of a linear sequence of amino acids, which figuratively appears as beads strung together into a strand of a necklace, and opens out to a consideration of a three-dimensional topography of the protein surface, which forms as the charge enveloping the molecule cause it to torque, bend, and fold and it, until it settles into a particular shape. Um, so in the poem that you actually see uh, up there, um, which is called the March, it's a concluding section of the March of the Nucleotides, he actually takes a title of one of Emily Dickinson's poems, Death Sets a, Death Sets a Thing Significant, and tries to, um, using his cipher, transforms it into a string of amino acid, acids and tries to actually model the possible protein shapes that the title of Dickinson's poem would make. So it's a kind of really strange translation from like Dickinson's poem to like protein shape. But I would argue that in this case, he's still kind of operating in this realm of modeling and he's not exactly like stuck in the, in the bind of actually having to deal with real folding molecules. There's still a kind of arbitrariness to this, although the three dimensionality is kind of, there's a kind of almost like a, 
volume button for three-dimensionality. I think it's been kind of slowly, I'm slowly turning it up. And we're somewhere almost, it's almost all the way up, but it's still a little bit arbitrary in these images because it's still kind of like just plugging in textual data into this computer. Um, so I won't kind of do a detailed reading of this um, just to kind of get to the end. Um, But one of the things that's interesting is that this, this computer models not only, you can kind of see the, the almost like that necklace of amino acids which is beginning to fold, but it also in the bottom picture you see this kind of white mesh, which is kind of the electric, sort of the electrical envelope around the molecule, and it's actually that envelope that allows the protein to fold in certain ways. So the computer is kind of modeling the electrical charges around the molecules as well, um, which is sort of interesting. Um, so I'll just kind of wrap up slowly, so you can kind of see different models that he had built over time of the protein molecule. Um, and here's another one here. So Book's attempt to create a second poetic site in the execution of the Xenotext in the lab extends the use of constraint-based procedures in the project much further towards an exploration of the materiality of molecular shapes, allowing it to act as a site of experimentation through which one can ask questions both about the relationship between constraint and poetic form but also broader, more interdisciplinary questions about the relationship between semiotic processes and situated and lively forms of unfolding biological materiality. As such, the constraint parameters set by the properties of the string of amino acids, which allow it to fold into a subset of some, but not all possible shapes, produce very specific limitations for the formal composition of the poem. Limitations that in this case operate not through an arbitrary or analogous alignment between letter and molecule that book largely relied on to set up the procedures for the encipherment of various codes in the poem, but through the very literal limitations imposed by molecular structures um, as they assume a particular folded shape. In other words, the primary constraint for the project comes to be located in the capacity of the amino acid string to fold into a viable protein molecule, and all other constraint-based compositional procedures radiate outward from this problematic. As such, the molecular structure itself, or the three-dimensional shape of the molecule, comes to bear a direct and constraining relation on poetic form and linguistic meaning. Such a view that linguistic and material processes are inextricably intertwined has been emerging within various approaches to non-human semiotics, or more broad broadly biosemiotics within post-humanism and animal studies, as I suggested at the opening of the paper, where terms such as material semiotic or the material discursive have come to signal such entwinement between signs and matter within biological systems. In How Forests Think, um, which we've already heard about, anthropologist Eduardo Kahn, for instance, writes that along with finitude, what we share with jaguars and other living selves, whether bacterial, floral, fungal, or animal, is the fact that how we represent the world around us, in some way or another, um, is constitutive of our being. In other words, by drawing on the semiotics of the American pragmatist philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, who we've also heard about, in particular his notion that indexical signs possess material relations with the objects they represent, Kahn investigates how linguistic signs move across human and non-human worlds in non-arbitrary non ways. Similarly, in Meeting the Universe Halfway, the physicist philosopher Karen Barad insists on the inseparability of matter and meaning alongside her sense that an agentive liveliness permeates all matter. Matter and meaning, Barad suggests, are inextricably fused together, and no event, no matter how energetic, can tear them asunder. Mattering is simultaneously a matter of substance and significance. In other words, from Barad's agential realist perspective, the discursive and the material arise simultaneously through an entangled becoming, forming an inextricable entwined realm that she refers to as the material discursive. Um, as I've pointed out, um, as I've argued here in attending to the complex entwinement of code and shape, the Xenotext experiment similarly offers an exploration of the material dimensions of biosemiotic processes, enacting a poetic experiment which, in facing the many challenges to the execution of its original conceptualization, actually testifies to the irresolvably complex, a comp irresolvable complexity of material semiotic entanglements. As I've pointed out, Book's project brings to the forefront the sense that code is not free-floating and disembodied, but that living organisms are material semiotic folds. Moreover, the molecules that they're composed of are literally three-dimensional folded shapes that generate the processes of life only through their materially and temporally situated interactions. So I'll end there. Um, 